Uh, so next Sunday, we will finish up our series on the Ten Commandments. But today, we have a special guest with us, Dr. Tony Wolf. He's the Director of Pastor and Church Relations with the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. He's going to speak this morning. Now, now he, you need to go easy on him a little bit. He is originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So between LSU losing to A&M last week and the Saints losing to the Cowboys Thursday night, it's been a rough week. Okay, so let's give him a warm... Warm, lonesome Dove, welcome. Come on up, uh, Tony. <laughs> oh, man. I am. I'm a recovering Saints and Tigers fan, so thank you for your warm reception. Find a Bible and turn to Psalm 67. Psalm 67, if you will. It's an honor to be with you guys this morning. I'm thankful to Pastor Jason just for the opportunity to, uh, to come and break open God's word with you. I don't know if you know this or not, hopefully you do, uh, if not, then you need to know it. Let me just tell you that you are a blessed church to call this man your pastor. Uh, he is an awesome guy. Let's give the Lord a hand for Pastor Jason. Yeah, and it's my honor to be with you this morning. I, I, I believe it or not, I'm kind of one of those Facebook stalkers, so I stalk Dove Church uh, on Facebook, and, and uh, every now and then, uh, Jason and I text back and forth. I just love to see what God's up to. This is a, this is a fresh new day at Dove Church, isn't it? And God is doing some awesome, awesome things, and I love to be able to just follow it uh, as he does his thing in this church, in this generation. So I do. I direct the Pastor Church Relations Department of the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. The last time I was here in this uh, worship center was about a year and a half ago, I guess, as Dr. Richards came, my executive director, and, and did the information meeting for you guys and just told you who the SBTC is. I know it's tempting to think that we're some organization in Grapevine, Texas, but honestly, the SBTC is a family of churches. We're a network of 2,702 churches that are theologically conservative, that care about Jesus and care about the nations and want the whole world and everybody in it to know the name and the fame of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. So we're locking arms together to reach Texas and touch the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you are one of these 2,702 churches. So your faithful giving through the cooperative program makes this possible. You are able to say, because you you cooperate in the cooperative program with the Southern Baptist Texas Convention, you're able to say that you are fully funding the salaries of 3,600 missionaries all over the globe. That's you. That's you. You're doing that. You are are scholarshiping 22,000 seminary students in six Southern Baptist seminaries across the United States today, who are the leaders of the church today and tomorrow. You're doing that, Dub Church. You are planting hundreds of churches in Texas and all over underreached areas of North America every single year because of your giving through the cooperative program. You are encouraging and equipping small church and bivocational pastors. You are training lay leaders in churches all across the state. You are doing these things because you are the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. So thank you for your faithful partnership uh, in cooperative giving. Psalm 67, the title of this sermon is The End of God's Blessing. Now, that'll bless your heart right there, isn't it? Right there. I mean, when I texted uh, Jason the, the sermon, I'm pretty sure he like looked at it and thought, oh, Lord, what is he going to come preach? The end of God's blessing. Not like, not like God's blessings are going to end sometime soon, so let me go ahead and put your heart at ease. Rather, the purpose, the end goal of God's blessings, the end, what's the end game? You know, God gives us blessings all the time. We sing about them uh, this morning, the fount of many blessings. What's the purpose of that? Have you ever stopped to think, why does God bless us? I mean, if he redeems us from sin and from death and hell and, and transplants us into the kingdom of the son he loves and he, and he gives us a new birth through repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ, then honestly, we are eternal creatures. We are going to live forever in heaven's glory. Why would God take the time to give eternal people temporary blessings? What's the point? I mean, we're going to have to check them all at the gates of heaven anyway. So why does God bless eternal creatures with temporal blessings? Well, certainly one reason is because he just loves us, right? And God knows how to give good gifts to the children he loves. That's one reason, but there's got to be more than that. So here's the question for the sermon today. Why does God bless us? Why does God bless us? And that's what I want to show you from Psalm chapter 67. So if you don't mind, stand with me to honor the reading of God's word, Psalm 67. I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, your Bible should be very close to this or something like it. So uh, Psalm 67, verses 1 through 7. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us. 
so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy, for you judge the peoples with fairness and lead the nations on earth. Verse 5, let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. God will bless us. And all the ends of the earth will fear him. Let's pray. Lord, we acknowledge this morning that this is your word. God, you, you penned this, you've protected it and preserved it for thousands of years now so that we could come in this place today and hear from you and encounter you, the living, loving God of the ages, and that we might walk away from this place today changed because of that. So, Lord, we've worshipped you in song. God, we sought your face in prayer. Lord, we're gathered as the fellowship of the redeemed. And right now, God, we pray that you would meet us through the presentation of your word. So, God, we invite your Holy Spirit to the, do the, uh, the work of conviction, the work of encouragement, the work of leading and of commissioning, not just in the space of this place, but in the spaces of our very hearts today. God, we're here to meet with you. This is our prayer in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Have a seat. Thank you. The Psalms are songs. The Psalms are songs. Have you stopped to think just how cool it is that this eternal, living, loving God of the ages would reveal himself to us, especially in the pages of the Bible, not just in uh, historical accounts, not just in Old Testament prophecy, and not just in Old Testament law codes, or not even just in New Testament gospel narratives or letters to churches or apocalyptic literature, no, but through songs that God would reveal something of his character and his nature to us, his people, through the generations, through songs. How cool is that? Well, songs have structures, and, and songs have this, uh, this purpose that they carry with them, and I want to take a minute just to be a little nerdy with you this morning, because I like to be nerdy, and that's why I have these glasses. So if you don't like it when people are nerdy, just take a nap for the next three minutes, and I'll catch back up with you in just a little while, okay? There are two things I need to explain about this text before we dig into the content. And the first thing is the word nations or peoples. This, uh, this word is translated for us eight times in seven verses. You would think it's kind of important in the text. Nations or yours might say peoples or, or people groups or people. Uh, so there are three Hebrew words that are used here in these seven verses. And the first word is goi. Goi means non-Jews. Obviously, this is, uh, this is God is revealing himself through the Jewish people, through the people of Israel. So goi, when he says goi, he means everybody except for Jews. In the New Testament, you would call them Gentiles, right? The second word he uses in this text interchangeably is the Hebrew word am, which means people groups, ethnic groups. Right now, there are over 2,000 identifiable ethno-linguistic groups around the world. Over 2,000 of them, 320 of them live in Houston, Texas. That's insane, isn't it? 2,000 groups of people, different groups of people that share a common ancestral DNA, a common cultural heritage, probably a common language and a common religious background as well. 2,000 different ethnic groups, and this psalm is addressing all of them, all of the alms. So those are the first two words. The third word he uses in this text is leom, which means an assembly. A group of people, that means just like us, we're a group of people from a bunch of different backgrounds and we're all gathered in this place today for one purpose. So he's saying all the assemblies all across the world. And the reason I needed to point this out to you is because this is the purpose of this text. This text is addressing not one group of people, not some groups of people, but all people everywhere will be the benefactor of this song. All right, so that's the first thing I need to point out to you. The second thing I need to point out to you in a nerdy fashion is its structure, the structure of the psalm. Songs have structure. Uh, most of the songs we sing today are in strophic form, right? They have a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, chorus, right? Something like that. That's strophic form. Well, this song has a structure, and I want to point it out to you. It's not quite like anything we sing. Let me do it like this. Look back at verse 1. Put your eyes on the text. And you'll see that probably in your Bible, verse 1 is broken up into two different poetic lines. You see that through paragraphs and indenting. Verse 1 has two poetic lines. It says, may God be gracious to us and bless us. And then the second poetic line is this, may he make his face to shine upon us. And then verse 2, again, is broken up into two different poetic lines. Pull your eyes down to verses 6 and 7. Again, two poetic lines each. The earth has produced its harvest is one poetic line. 
God, our God blesses us, is another poetic line. And then verse 7 is also broke up into two poetic lines. Okay, now put your, that's kind of verse 1 is, uh, it, or stanza 1 is verses 1 and 2. Stanza 2 is going to kind of be verses 6 and 7. Now put your eyes on verse 3. Verse 3, two poetic lines. Verse 5, two poetic lines. But verse 4, three poetic lines. This is the only verse in the psalm that has three poetic lines. Now you would ask yourself why, or you would ask me why if you're still awake, right? Why? Why does this psalm have, uh, have all these different verses, six different verses with two poetic lines, but the middle verse has three? Well, I can tell you it's pretty simple. It's because that's the focal point of the psalm. All the other stuff is kind of wrapping around this meat in the middle. It's kind of like a psalm sandwich. Amen? I love sandwiches. I don't know what you people do here in South Lake, South Lake Texas, but, but I'm from Baton Rouge. Right, we already heard that today, and you cried a tear for me. Thank you. I'm from Baton Rouge, and, uh, you know, Thanksgiving was just a couple of weeks ago, and we deep fry our turkeys in the wolf's home. Can I get an amen? Right, I don't know what y'all do. Like, you might smoke them or stuff them or bake them or rotisserate them. I just made that word up. Or any number of other things, and that's cool. But in the wolf house, we just decided that we're going to go ahead and prepare our turkeys down here like they will be prepared in heaven. And that is injected with Cajun seasoning and 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 basted with butter and, and on the outside just rubbed down with Tony Sacheries and then deep fried in peanut. Amen and hallelujah, right? That's how we prepare our turkeys. You just look at it and your arteries start clogging. It's so good. So you eat turkey all day on Thursday, and then on Friday, what do you eat? Turkey sandwiches. All day. I'm talking about turkey sandwich for breakfast, turkey sandwich for brunch, turkey sandwich for lunch, turkey sandwich for lupper. Y'all don't know that about lupper here. I grew up in South Louisiana. Amen. So lupper, turkey sandwich for supper, turkey sandwich for midnight snack. We are eating some turkey sandwiches. Amen. And I love sandwiches. That's cool. As long as it has a good meat in the middle and a lot of it, I am in for a sandwich. Right? So what we're looking at here is a psalm sandwich, a psalm sandwich. The meat is in the middle. Okay, so that's what we're focusing on. The meat is in the middle. If you had to ask me what's the point of this psalm, then it would be verse 4. And here's, here's the point of the whole sermon in one sentence. You would say, well, you could just say this and go home. That wouldn't be any fun for me, maybe for you. But here's the middle point. Here it is. The point of this psalm is that all people everywhere would know and worship the one true God. That's the point of this psalm. That all people everywhere would know and worship God. The one true God. Okay, well, let's look at the top slice of bread, verses 1 and 2, and here's what we're going to see. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. Will you say that with me? Ready, set, go. We are blessed to be a blessing. Look at verses 1 and 2. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us, which, by the way, is Aaron's priestly blessing from number 6, reworded. Verse 2 says, so that your way may be known on earth your salvation among all nations. Now, when God blesses his children, there are two very common downfalls, two ways that we misuse or abuse the blessings of God. And here's the first way. The first way we often mis misuse or abuse the blessings of God is when we value the blessing more than the blesser. Does that make sense? That's a common way that all of us at some point in our lives abuse the blessings of God. When we value the blessing more than we value the blessed er. You have a great example of this in Luke chapter 17. Let's say a negative example in Luke chapter 17. Jesus healed 10 lepers and he sent them on their way to present themselves to the priest clean. And on their way to present themselves to the priest clean, they were healed, they were cleansed of leprosy. I mean, it's their one prayer in their life was to be cleansed and healed of leprosy. And they were, but out of those 10, how many of them returned to give thanks to Jesus? One. Why is that? Because the nine valued the blessing more than they valued the blesser. That's a negative example in Scripture. Now, by way of positive example, in Luke chapter 5, you have Jesus who is, who's helping people fish. And I love to fish. And if fishing was my, uh, my trade, and that's how I earned my living, and it was my family business, I might be a little offended that some stranger on the shore is going to call out to me and tell me how to fish. But not these guys. They listened. They were desperate. They, they, they needed money to live, and fish was how they got money. Jesus said, cast your net on the other side of the boat. And they did, and they raked in the biggest haul of their life and then they came back to the shore, and what did they do? They dropped the fish, they dropped the nets, they dropped the boat, they left the family business behind to do what? Follow Jesus. You know why? Because they followed the valued the blesser more than the blessing. 
Okay? So there's two examples of this for us. I'm sorry, I'm going to knock something over before the day is over. So we here's the thing. God's blessings, the blessings of God's hand, always reveal something about God's heart. And our common problem is, common meaning we share it among us all, we often seek God's hand over seeking God's heart, don't we? So my question to you, first of all today, is this. In what ways might you have been valuing the blessings of God over the heart of God? In what ways have you, in your prayer life and in your home life and when you come to church and you're faithful doing the church thing, in what ways have you been seeking the hand of the Father more than you've been seeking the heart of the Father? That's the third way we commonly misuse and abuse God's blessing. Now the second way we commonly misuse and abuse God's blessing, get this, is when we receive the downward direction of God's blessing, but we fail to embrace the outward injunction of God's blessing. Let me say that again. Sometimes injunction just means instruction or command. So sometimes we receive the downward blessings of God, amen, thank you God, but we don't embrace the outward injunction of those blessings. See, every blessing that comes from God's hand to us carries with it a purpose, and that purpose is an outward Injunction, And that's kind of what we're seeing in our text today. So here's our question again. Why does God bless us? All the blessings you have in your life. Now, you're thinking financial, right? But they may be financial blessings. They may be relational blessings. They may be in your education. It may be in your occupation. It may be in your residence. It may be your passions and your talents. Like these guys lead worship this morning, these ladies. Anything at all, any blessing at all that you've received has come downward to you, James says, from the Father of lights. He is able to supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Even in Malachi, in the tithing chapter, he says, bring the full tithe, the full tenth, into my house and see if I don't open up the storehouse of blessings for you and what? Pour out on you a blessing you cannot contain. All of the blessings come from God downward to us in Christ Jesus. So get this. In Christ Jesus, the gifts of God's grace flow to us so that they might flow to us. In Christ, every blessing that God has ever given you, tangible or intangible, he has given to you so that it might flow through you. Now you say, well, that's that's great. I mean, I'm surprised by that. Well, where do you see that in the text? Or Jason has trained you well. If it's not in the text, if we don't believe it, we don't preach it. So put your eyes back on verse 2. And I will tell you this point is in the so that-ness of verse 2. Here's verse 2. So that your way may be known on earth. Your salvation among all nations. What's the prayer here? God bless us so that your way may be known on the earth. Your salvation among all nations. Don't miss this point. God's blessings are always meant to fuel God's mission. God's blessings are always meant to fuel God's mission. So with what has God blessed you? With what uh, circle of influence have you been raised? With what uh, occupational influence have you been blessed? With what familial influence have you been blessed? With what tangible financial blessings have you been blessed? With what kind of stuff have you been blessed? How has God blessed you? And let me ask you this question now. How are you leveraging that so that the nations might know and worship the one true God? How are you leveraging God's blessings so that the nations might know and worship the one true God? That is the end of God's blessing. If God's blessings end with you, then we're not doing our job. We're supposed to be And that leads us nicely into the second point. That was the first slice of bread. And now we're into the meat of the song where we're going to see this. Our heart's desire, as followers of Jesus, our heart's desire must be that the nations know and worship the one true God. It has to come from our heart. Our heart's desire must be that the nations know and worship the one true God. Look at it, verses 3 and 5. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. And verse 5 repeats that. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. But the meat of the psalm is in verse 4. It says this. Let the nations rejoice and shout for joy. For you judge the peoples with fairness and lead the nations on the earth. Speaking of sandwiches, I love the idea of sandwiches. I was at a new 
restaurant the other day and uh, opened up their menu. And it was one of those typical, it was like a, like a novel of a menu. You know, they have so many choices. I'm like, just give me two or three that are good, right? But I turned to the burgers section. And they had good burgers. They had like a buffalo burger and a blue cheese. But I don't like blue cheese on anything else except for a burger. But amen, it's good. I mean, jalapeno burgers and double cheese burgers. And, and it was, I was getting excited, right? And then I came across this abomination on the menu and it said, veggie burger. $9. And I had two thoughts, right? First of all, who would pay $9 for a bunch of veggies on a bun? And secondly, that's a disgrace to burgers everywhere, that you would actually call that a burger, veggie burger. You might be a vegetarian. If you are, I'm sorry. But seriously, so veggie burger, $9. And then directly under that was written these words, add bacon, $2. (laughs) Now, I'm no iron chef, Pastor Jason. I'm not really even that smart. But it seems to me that if you order the veggie burger and add bacon, you've missed the point of the matter entirely. Wouldn't you agree? Right. So let's not miss the point of the matter because that's what this sandwich song is all about. The point is in verse 4, and the point is that the nations would know and worship the one true God. Here's the point. Here's here's what our spiritual uh, saliva glands should be moistened with just the thought of this. Here it is. You ready? Here's the point. God is so... Good. God is so good. If the nations only knew him, oh man, doesn't that make your spiritual saliva glands moisten just thinking, oh, if the nations just knew how good and great and gracious our one true God is, if they only knew how much he loves them, if they only knew the plan and the purpose that he had for their life, if they only knew, oh, God is so good. How is God so good? Well, first of all, because he judges the people with fairness. He judges the people with fairness. Now, this may not make a whole lot of sense to you in our American westernized culture, but Pastor Jason knows this very well. When you go to other parts of the world, there are people who are oppressed, who are murdered, who are mistreated and maltreated and and, and even killed, not because Christian versus non-Christian, but because their governments are horrible. They take advantage of the people and they murder them and they destroy them and they, and, and, they, and they abuse their people. Oh, if they only knew the God of the Bible who judges the people with fairness, some of them wouldn't even know how to receive that. They've never experienced fairness before in judgment. Oh, if they only knew the one true God of the Bible who judges the people with fairness. But not only that, he leads all people. Did you see that here in verse 4? You lead the nations on earth. Now, how are you going to lead somebody who doesn't even know they're following you? That's a good question, isn't it? Right? Because as far as I know, the only definition of a leader is someone who has followers. How are you going to lead? How's God going to lead somebody who don't even know they're following him? Here, I can tell you why. Because the whole world and time itself is singing God's song. The whole world, there's a point to this. See, we make this mistake. We say history is cyclical. Have you ever heard that or have you ever said that? Now, I understand that we repeat certain things from our history. We make the same mistakes that we made in the past. But history itself is not cyclical. We say history is like a pendulum, right? We see that especially in politics. Democrat, Republican. Democrat, Republican. They just kind of swing back and forth. And every generation reacts against the previous one, right? We say history is like a pendulum. No, we might repeat certain things like that, but history is not a a pendulum. History is linear. It is headed somewhere. It had a beginning and it will have an end. History started with in the beginning God and it will end with even so come Lord Jesus. But right now we're living the middle. Right now, we're living in the meat of history, and God is leading all people everywhere forward in his direction as he tells his story through the generations. And what is this story God's telling? What's the point? What's the Why are we even here? It's so that the nations might know and worship the one true God. And God has invited you into this story to take part of the gospel story that he's telling in this generation right now. Man, this isn't our home. I mean, that's not my home, right? I'm not, I'm not living for anything on earth. I'm living for heaven's glory. That's where I'm headed. I'm headed to the promised land, and I'm ready to get there whenever God's ready to call me there. That means this may not be my home, but listen to me, friend, this is my time. This isn't our home, but this is our time. 
And God's invited every one of us to take part in this gospel story. What's, you ever look around and say, God, what in the world are you doing? Natural disasters, church and school shootings, moral decay. I mean, in our country, God, what are you doing? You want to know what God's doing today? He's redeeming people from every language, every nation, every tribe, every tongue so that they can sing his song around his throne in glory with you. God is currently doing the same thing he's been doing through all the generations. He is calling people out of sin, death, and hell and into the kingdom of the son he loves. He's redeeming them. He's he's giving them a new birth and a new name. He's making them new creations. He's washing their sin clean through the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and making them fit for eternity in heaven with him. That's what God's doing today. I don't know what you're doing today, but that's what God's doing today. And instead of asking God, okay, God, won't you come be a part of my story? God, won't you come bless me so that that my end can be your means? I think we need to ask a different question. God, what are you doing? What's your story? And how can I fit into it? History is linear. It's headed somewhere. And God has invited you for a very short time to play play a significant part in it. God only has one plan to reach the world for Jesus. Just one. And it's you. The Holy Spirit-filled local church. That's it. So how are you leveraging the blessings of God to reach the nations for Christ? There are 8 billion people on the planet. 8 billion people on the planet. And I don't know about you, but I don't really have a context to understand the number 8 billion. So last night when I was mourning the recent losses of my football teams, I, uh, <clears throat> I looked up some, some explanations, some analogies for 8 billion. Here you go. This is going to bless your heart. Here's number one. If you were to travel 8 billion miles, you could fly around the world 321,272 times. 8 billion. If you could save $100,000 a year, if you could save $100,000 a year, it would take you 80,000 years to save $8 billion. If you could live for only 8 billion minutes, then you would die at the young age of 15,221. These last two are going to make you Love Jesus even more. Eight billion Coca-Colas ago, it was last Wednesday. (laughs) Okay, here's one. At the rate at which our U.S. government currently spends money, I had to go there. Eight billion dollars ago, it was three o'clock yesterday afternoon. And you could save $100,000 a year for the next 80,000 years and pay it back for these last 22 hours or so. Eight billion people. How in the world is one church going to take the gospel, the name and the fame of Jesus Christ, to eight billion people who are currently living in this generation right now? They're going to do it by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, locking arms with other local New Testament churches just like this one, They're going to do it because they're biblically based, they're kingdom focused, they're missionally driven, and they only have one purpose, one mission, and that is the great commission to take the name and the fame of Jesus around the globe in this generation. That's how churches do it. So here's my, I mean, I've got one more point. Don't get too excited. But here's my thing. You have this choice. Every day of your life, you have this choice to either live your life or to outlive your life. Now, if you just want to live your life, then go ahead and be a consumer of God's blessings and let them end with you. You can live your life that way. But if you want to outlive your life, then you don't need to be a consumer of God's blessings. You need to be a conduit of God's blessings. You've got to allow God's blessings to flow to you so that they can flow through you. And I'm not just talking about your pocketbook. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your relationships and everything else that you need to be leveraging for the glory of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ in this generation right now because like that, your time is going to be up. How are you leveraging God's blessings so that the 
nations might know how good and great the one true God really is. I guess my only my point is sing the song, right? Live the meat. Don't settle for anything less. Here's the last piece of bread here, this last verses 6 and 7, and the point is this. God is faithful to bless his children. God is faithful to bless his children. Will you say that with me? Ready, set, go. God is faithful to bless his children. Look at verses 6 and 7. Tell, uh, excuse me. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Look at it one more time. The earth has produced its harvest. That's past tense. God, our God, blesses us. That's present tense. God will bless us. That's future tense. And all the ends of the earth will fear him. Now, it's tempting to make these passages something they're not, right? Because when, you, when you, you're a Christian, especially if you're a seasoned Christian, you've been around the faith for a while, you've been around church for a while, you see the word harvest, and you think, the harvest of souls. Amen. I know. And if you want an Old Testament reference to the harvest of souls, go to Joel chapter 2. That's not what this is in reference to. This only makes sense in its context. The earth has produced its harvest. Stuff has come out of the ground that makes our lives better, right? God has made his face to shine upon us. God has blessed the work of our hands and produced harvest from out of the ground. That's, that's what this verse is saying. God has blessed us. God will bless us. The earth has produced its harvest. That means I can count on God to be the God who blesses me. At every point in my life, I always have more than I deserve. And honestly, more than enough. God's been faithful in my past. Man, I hope you look back sometimes and maybe you can start making a note, right? How has God been faithful in your past? How, what's he done for you that you can just list out and say, oh, my God, it's so good. He's done this and this and this and this in my life and in my marriage and in my family and in my church and in my friendships and in my job and in my social life and in my hobbies. God has done all these things. God has blessed me. And God is blessing me right now. God is doing these things in my life. Oh, he's so good. And because on the basis of God's past faithfulness and the basis of God's present faithfulness, I can count on God's future faithfulness. So why would I hoard the blessings of God and let them end with me when I know beyond a doubt that he's blessed me in the past, he's blessing me right now, that means he will be faithful to bless me in the future. Why would I let God's blessings end with me when I know God is so faithful to give me everything I need and so much more, which always amounts to infinitely more than I actually deserve. So my challenge to you is to sing this song. And I don't mean just with your vocal cords. I mean with your life. I mean sing it with your feet. And sing it with your hands. And sing it with your heart. And sing it with your mouth. Because you are God's one plan to propagate the gospel among the nations. This church must be about the Father's business. It has no other mission than the Great Commission. That means you have to go to people with the feet of Jesus, serve them with the hands of Jesus, love them with the heart of Jesus, speak to them with the voice of Jesus, because your time is too short and your mission is too important for anything less. Amen? It's the end of God's blessings that the nations might know and worship the one true God. Can I tell you one more thing and I'm done? doesn't matter if you say no, I'm going to tell it to you anyway. Whoever you are, in whatever walk of life you've come from into this place today, God created you in his image and after his likeness, and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. You are beautiful by design and designed for a beautiful purpose just the way you are. But your problem is the same as my problem. Our sin separates us from God. God is holy and just and righteous and pure, and I'm so far from that. But because God loves you, he had to make a way to cleanse us from our sin and make us fit for eternity in heaven with him. He did that through his son Jesus, who came and lived the perfect sinless life that you and I could never live died a horrible death on the cross of Calvary and endured the full weight of God's wrath against sin for everybody who believes, which is a terrible price that you and I could never fully pay. 
He was buried in a borrowed tomb to take our sin far away to the pits of the grave where you and I could never fully take it. And he rose up from the dead on the third day to seal his victory over sin, death, and hell for all who would believe throughout the generations across the geographic spectrum if you would just receive this gift. God will take your old life and lay it to rest and he'll give you new life and a new name and new purpose in Jesus Christ. You can walk out of here today with a new name written in glory, a life full of purpose and power while you wait. How do I do that, Tony? Trust in Jesus. Give your life to him. He can do more with it than you could ever dream. Let me pray for you, and I'll ask Pastor Jason to come up and extend the invitation. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this time. Thank you that you bless us, that you're so faithful to bless us. God, in seasons when we are faithless, you're faithful. And God, when we're unlovable, you love us. So, God, thank you for your blessings. Lord, I pray that through the conviction of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit this morning, that people who have gathered, redeemed people, saved, who have gathered in this place today, walk away with a renewed commitment and a renewed resolve to leverage every blessing of God so that the nations might know and worship the one true God. Whatever that looks like in individual lives. And also, Lord, I know there might be some here today, there are likely some here today, who don't know how good and great and gracious you are because they don't know you through repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, today I pray that the work of your Holy Spirit would draw men and women boys and girls, to faith in Jesus Christ so that they can walk out of here saved, changed, brand new for your glory and for their good in Christ's name.